Well, thank you for having me here. This is uh, my first time ever to New Zealand was last March to visit Robotics Plus. This is my ninth trip in 14 months. Uh, I've fallen in love with this country and the people, and it's, uh, it's been a pleasure working with Steve and Alistair. I uh, want to give a little context. Uh, people often ask, you know, why is Yamaha interested in agriculture? We're not known as an agricultural company. We make uh, all-terrain vehicles and quads, and you'll see them on farms throughout New Zealand, but globally, we're not really known as an ag company. Uh, and, and so people are often asking me, why Yamaha? Why do we choose to sponsor an event like this, and then why New Zealand? Uh, so I'll just take a few quick minutes to, to explain that and, and talk about our investment in Robotics Plus and what we believe is the future of agricultural robotics and automation. Um, uh, as he uh, correctly pointed out, I'm one of the founding members of Yamaha Motor Ventures. We're the corporate venturing and strategic business development arm of Yamaha Motor. Uh, so we're really looking at uh, next generation technologies uh, and businesses that we can invest in or partner in to build the next billion dollar business uh, or hundred million uh, billion dollar business. We're not looking for just products that we can extend our existing product lineup. And uh, when we first launched Yamaha Motor Ventures, we actually weren't thinking of agriculture as an area of opportunity. Our mandate was autonomous vehicles, uh, industrial automation, and robotics as areas for potential future growth. And it became very obvious very quickly that agriculture needed all three of those things. Uh, but no one on our team had any ag experience. Uh, and as a company, again, we don't really uh, have an ag business with the exception of our unmanned helicopter. Some of you may have seen that helicopter uh, uh, out in the uh, exhibition area. What a lot of people don't realize is over one third of all rice fields in Japan are sprayed using those helicopters. Um, we have a fleet of 2,700 of them in Japan, and we've started bringing that technology to New Zealand. And uh, the guys out there, Cameron and Sam, if you haven't had a chance to meet them, please introduce yourself. They're great guys. They're looking for new opportunities and new areas to uh, expand their business. But with the exception of that helicopter platform, we really haven't done anything in agriculture. And I, I'm a former firefighter, actually, uh, and I used to ride on fire trucks and spray water around. And, the thought of being able to ride on tractors and go outdoors, I was like, sign me up. So I volunteered to head up our ag uh, initiatives. It's a little under three years now that I've been focused on it. And one of the first things I realized when I started looking at ag, uh, I, California was just coming out of a 10-year drought, and I thought all the growers were going to say water was their biggest issue. To this day, I've never met a grower. Uh, if there's one in the audience, please raise your hand. But I've never met a grower that has said that water is their number one issue. It is an issue, to be sure. But the number one issue I've heard time and time again, regardless of where I travel around the world, is the labor shortage, um, just scarcity of labor and the cost of labor going up. And many global growers have said that that is putting a cap on their future growth. Um, uh, you know, S Steve and I were, we did an interview for uh, Tech Week TV a little uh, earlier today, and Steve was pointing out that uh, I guess the local newspaper here talked about there was a labor shortage of 1,200 workers for the, for the kiwi harvest. Well, given the future trajectory of Zespri's growth plans, uh, if there's 1,200 short today, how many tens of thousands are we going to be short in 10 years? And this is a global problem, even notwithstanding what, whatever you hear Trump say, uh, in the United States, we have net negative immigration uh, with Mexico. More Mexicans are returning to Mexico than coming into the United States. And they have an agricultural field worker shortage. They're bringing in workers from Central and South America. So this is a global problem that we have to solve. And when we started looking at agriculture, we thought, well, we make vehicles. We, we also have a robotics division. A lot of people don't realize that. We make robotic arms, we make high-speed pick-and-place machines. So we have these technologies, and we thought, well, how can we bring those together to solve this uh, labor shortage? Uh, and part of that was also, what should we be looking at? How should we be approaching the problem? And that's when I met Steve. I actually met Steve at a conference that we sponsored two years ago. We were actually riding on a bus together, and he was sitting next to me, and he was telling me about his business. And it, and it occurred to me that if we wanted to be successful in agricultural uh, automation and robotics, we had to have a dual hemisphere strategy. 
if we design something just for California, that may be good for California, but that's not going to solve the global problem. We need to be able to get in the field and iterate and test as much as possible. So when the harvest season is done in California, the goal is that we could come down and work with Steve to uh, test those same technologies uh, down here in New Zealand, and vice versa. As they develop technologies, our ability to take them up to California or other uh, parts of the world and, and test them. And so we saw a, a great opportunity to collaborate and partner with them uh, in creating that global dual hemisphere strategy. So one of the things that uh, uh, you know really impressed us when I met with Alistair and Steve, I think there's a, oh, earlier there was a picture of their Apple Packer up there. Um, one of the technologies they have is, a, is an Apple Packing machine. And uh, Yamaha, as I mentioned, we make pick and place machines. They're, they're high speed pick and place machines. They make uh, circuit boards. They place little microchips and transistors and resistors on, on, a, on a circuit board. Uh, we have robots that can place 13 chips per second. I mean, we're talking super high speed. And we brought several of our engineers out, and they looked at what Alistair built with uh, the Apple Packer, and they're like, man, we don't, we don't think we could do better. These guys, they nailed it. And they built it with off-the-shelf parts, the, the, the way it was designed, the, the efficiency of the machine. It really impressed us, and we thought, you know, we really, when we want to have that global partner, we also looked at Steve and, you know, all the things that, uh, that, that were mentioned about Steve in the introduction. He, he has this broad knowledge of the entire value chain, not just the robotics, but the breeding, the, uh, the cultivation, the uh, harvesting, the packing, the logistics. Because one thing we've learned is you, you can't just solve one part of the value chain. Uh, we were talking to a, a, a table grape grower in California, and everyone thinks the low-hanging fruit, pardon the pun, uh, in table grapes is that the harvester is, spends about 30% of their time just shuttling the fruit back to the end of the row where somebody packs it into a punnet. And we were talking to, to them about maybe building some kind of autonomous ground vehicle that could, could do that shuttling work. And he's like, that would be cool if we had it, but you're just going to create a bottleneck at the packer. The packer's not moving faster, so if we make the harvester faster, that's awesome, but now you just have fruit piling up at the packer. So the only way to solve the problem is to change the entire growing system and the, and the cultural practices and maybe pack in a pack house. So you have to really think about that whole value chain, and that, that's why we really wanted to work with Steve, because he understood the value chain. He had investments and partnerships throughout the value chain, and that gave us unique insights and perspective. So uh, a couple of months ago, we announced that we had made uh, an, an equity investment uh, in Robotics Plus. We're really excited. It's our first investment here in New Zealand. Um, this is our first conference that we've uh, also sponsored. We also became a sponsor of the Lincoln Hub uh, Ag Tech Center. Uh, and we're in the process of looking to open the first branch office of Yamaha Motor Ventures here in the Southern Hemisphere, probably located in uh, Sydney because that's where uh, we, uh, Yamaha Motor runs the, the region, but they would have uh, a mandate for New Zealand uh, to help us build out our agricultural automation uh, operations, either through investments, partnerships, or collaborations. So with that, uh, I, I really want to turn the floor over to Steve and Alistair. I think what they're doing is really amazing. And I couldn't be happier to be, you know, part of it. And thank you for, for letting us, you know, be part of the journey with you. Because the future really is about automation. With, with population growing the way it is, with the demand for fresh, nutritious food growing the way it is, um, this, is this is something that, that we all have to get behind. And we have to, uh, we have to solve this problem. I, I often tell people, I want my children uh, to, and my grandchildren to be able to eat fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so those of you who are old enough, maybe you remember the movie Soylent Green. Uh, I don't want my kids to have to just eat processed food. I want them to be, eat health, uh, healthy, nutritious food. And that was something that also impressed me about Steve, is he, often, he always added the word nutritious. The food needs to be nutritious. It needs to be fresh. It needs to be healthy. And so that's a big part of why we wanted to partner with these guys. They've got great technology for the pack house, for the field, uh, and then they've got that, that broad understanding of the value chain. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to you guys. Thank you. Video. Video. Thank you very much indeed, George. And, um, so tell me about Robotics Plus. It's a deep, deep question. <laughs> 
we really started as was a fortuitous meeting with Steve actually when I was still at university. I think um, you know I was really fortunate to meet such a young you know talent at the time. Met him and talked about fruit harvesting and how we could do that robotically. It's all really spun out from there. I got really excited and I was also very keen to about how do we start to create those moments of empowerment where we can take young, talented people and give them a place where they can actually experiment and start to create new technologies. You can't develop that technology in a lab. You have to be out in the orchard, so Steve was willing to support the process at that point and actually continue that development. So at that point it really became me in a workshop up here, um, building and developing that technology further. It's really around this autonomous vehicle, so a vehicle that can drive around an orchard by itself and then putting functional units on top of that. We put picking arms on it or we put pollination systems on it, but the first real commercial runs is going to be this, this apple packing technology that we've got. I met some um, really great pioneering apple growers who were really interested in what technology could do for the apple packing industry. And you know, it was probably a good couple of months there of persevering and you know, saying, hey, we, we know this is feasible, but how do we go about you know, polishing some of those areas of the technology to actually make it a reality? And I think the day we cracked it was probably the, the stepping stone of knowing we had something that was a real relevance. Pretty cool step to see that technology running like that. The apple packer, the kiwi fruit harvester, they're just pieces in that puzzle. So the vision for robotics plus, robotics to feed the world by powering up productivity in food and fibre value chains. What we're doing is we're stepping out of a really nice, clean, industrial environment and actually working in some very complex environments. My son loves it. I can actually describe to him what I do. I mean, the machines, the machines are just amazing. What these guys have achieved, just here, a building in the middle of Kiwi Fruit Block out in Tauranga. We're actually trying to solve real problems, not creating a technology distantly and then trying to implement it in. It's just about being out there and doing it. It's exciting that we're starting to achieve that. Kia ora tato. It's, um, it's awesome to be here um, and uh, sharing our vision is um, robotics to help feed the world. And um, um, thanks to George um, for the sponsorship and Tech Week and Peter and um, Jackie for all the hard work. So um, let's crack into it. So the big challenge, 10 billion mouths to feed by 2050. Already though, we're, we're facing ageing farmers, reducing labour availability, massive labour requirements, limited natural resources, environmental impacts, all things that are really already limiting us with this growth cycle ahead. Labour, we can see here, this is rapidly becoming a dominant global challenge across the uh, intensive horticultural operations. As George was saying, you know, net negative um, Mexicans coming into, into America. This year alone in New Zealand, the first time we're seeing in the apple industry, the kiwi fruit industry, highlights of real labour shortages, yet both of those industries are on rapid scale up in terms of production and volumes. That number is only going to get worse as we go forward. We think about people like uh, Bruce Taylor, CEO of Taylor Farms, founder of, uh, in, uh, in America, the biggest leafy um, uh, vegetable producers in the US. And he was uh, seen at a concert, basically saying, uh, concert, uh, <laughs> um, at, a, at a conference saying, um, you know, that we may not see some of the fruits and vegetables that we're used to eating today in 10 years' time because it's no longer going to be sustainable to grow. Jonathan Foley, um, Director of Institute of Environment, saying that, um, you know, by 2050 we've got 9, 9 billion, 10 billion people to, to feed and we'll need to increase the global supply by 25% just to feed everyone. And we're already using a planet's uh, worth of land. Good challenges. But also to counteract that though, when we look at the food chain system, one third of all food we produce is wasted. Half, half of fresh produce is wasted. So there's an incredible amount of opportunity to close that 25% gap by dealing with those issues. So when we look at the global challenges, um, 
we see robotics playing quite a key role across a number of these, these areas. Waste, so imagine with um, automation technology sensors today that we can reduce the waste by knowing more about that product from the minute we touch it in the orchard or where it comes from. Yield security, the question around what happens in a world without bees? So how do we, how do we compensate for that? We've already got diseases in, in America, colony collapse, that's seeing almond crops, things like that not getting pollinated already. Environmental impacts, how can robotics and automation support those um, impacts by intensifying um, highly productive um, food production systems with automation? The ability to scale, how do we scale to actually feed the world? Um, traceability, again, the automation, robotics, sensors, technologies, being able to give all the information from the minute that fruit's harvested all the way to the consumer. And hygiene, we've just seen a recent breakout, I think, in America, George, of um, salmonella causing a whole lot of sicknesses. That whole hygiene issue is becoming a major. Again, robotics can play a, a, a big role in that. But for us, really, at the moment, our core focus has really been on the labour issue. You know, in New Zealand alone, we've got health and um, safety concerns, we've got compliances lifting. Um, labour costs are starting to increase globally. Um, not only in New Zealand, but in places like California and US, by 2020, 65% um, increases in the minimum wage. And you already, uh, you've already got US farmers paying up to 30 US dollars an hour to get labour to harvest their crops. And there's a number of crops that are already getting discs back into the ground because they can't get enough labour to harvest them. Global immigration laws are tightening, um, like, like our friend Mr Trump and the, and the war between Mexico and America. But, you know, we've got new governments coming in and countries all around the world and those immigration laws are tightening. Brexit, those sorts of things. Um, and it's strenuous, repetitive work. It's work that people don't want to do. That, you know, we just, people are moving on and people are, are more excited about tech and other opportunities. If we look at the industrial world 80 years ago and think about the automotive industry, you can, 80 years ago it was all about jobs and people and, you know, building. But as, you know, as, as the world moved on, Auto industry today, I found two people in that photo, one's hiding behind a pillar up there somewhere and one's on the other side. But you can see how the industrial world has really moved on from that, from that labour, uh, reliance on labour to total automation. And when we, when we look at horticulture, we look at the strawberry harvesting 50 years ago, and then we look at that today, the only difference is we've now got colour TV. But we're still doing the same things, and I still remember being in the kiwi fruit industry for, for 34 years now, and I, we're still picking in a bag that I picked in 35 years ago. So, you know, we really haven't moved in that there's been this real disconnect between agriculture and technology for a long time, and, but now the, the pressures are really coming, and the investment hasn't been made in those intensive horticultural um, crops. They've been, most of the investment's gone into a lot of the broad acre solutions but not the intensive crops. It's very complex, it's very complicated. So our mission really is powering up productivity in the food and um, fibre value chains, um, about being user focused. Um, you know, you've got to create rely, uh, rel reliable, relevant technologies. No point in building a $20 million robot that no farmer is ever going to be able to afford or makes no economic sense. You've got to, um, to do this, it's about partnerships, about collaborations. There's a lot of different technologies have to go in to solve these complex um, problems. So it is about um, good um, collaborations and partnerships to achieve the competitive advantage and the opportunity. It's about fostering that talent, um, assembling clever people with new ways of thinking um, uh, and new, new ways of doing old things. And it's got to be a systems thinking approach you know, solutions that really start with the understanding of what the true problem is you're trying to solve, and actually the, the, the value chain that you're trying to introduce that system into. Um, you know, the uniqueness about Robotics Plus, it's part of the Plus group of companies. What we did really was, this was a vision for me to say, um, by owning orchards and a value chain, I was always thinking, where are we going to be in five years and 10 years, and what were the challenges going to be? So a number of years ago, I could see labour um, looming up looming up fast. And so I started to think about how would I solve that labour problem moving in the future. And that's really where Robotics Plus got born and my, uh, the fortuitous opportunity that I met um, Dr. Alice Scarf at Massey and we started on a journey um, on creating a globally fo relevant robotics company. So founded from the vision of sustainability was what it was really about. Um, and, uh, you know, um, that was about 
protecting my value chain into the future, but through that journey, you know, we've really found out that this is not only my value chain, it's a global value chain problem. And we're right there at the forefront, really pushing hard to solve those problems. But to get this done, we've got to build a great team, and that's not easy, um, and build a world-class team. So we've been on this uh, great journey of, um, you know, the last few years is building a team from me and Alistair and, and Kyle to this quite large, sizable team here now, um, really to solve these problems. And that's everything from software engineers, mechatronics, mechanical, researchers, um, administrative production, product development. So it's, it's, a, you know, it's a huge task. There's multi, multi talents that have to come in to, to solve these problems. And then partnering for global success is absolutely key. People like Yamaha, fantastic to have on board. That opens our world to a global footprint. It opens our world to new um, engineering expertise and opportunities. Um, it, it, it means we've got people that can validate our design for manufacture and support that. Um, the work that George does in America, connecting us with other food producers and opportunities, all those things, really important. And then in things like our apple packers, Jenkins Fresh Pack and Van Doren in the US, opening those doors into those packing facilities. We don't want to replicate a sales and service team, why not work with the best and those that are already in those ecosystems? So partnerships are really important. And then across the government ecosystem, partnerships with Callaghan, NZT, universities, um, building those collaborative relationships about um, building and creating the science and the technologies that we need to actually make this uh, reality. And then uh, um, finally for me is really just around, also as a grower, starting to think about um, creating automation for the future um, and growing orchards for the future. So, so many times do we have people come and say, can you come and look at solving this, um, you know, build a robot for this problem? When I'm looking at their growing system going, um, you're, you're not even growing efficiently. Why would I want to create technology for something that's non efficient? We have to start to think about if you want automation in these horticultural crops, you've actually got to start thinking about how you grow for automation. And so what you're seeing there is on, the, on, the, on my uh, left is the New Zealand Future um, Orchards Program, and on my right is um, orchard um, production systems happening in the US, gearing up for automation. So they are really, really key, um, key points. And I'll hand you on to Alistair. Thank you. Hopefully, get a microphone, cool. So I get to bring some of the tech aspect into Tech Week and really show you what we're bringing together to achieve that vision of where we want to be. And it's pretty cool, you saw that dynamic team we're forming and it's really around a lot of these sort of four focuses. So what we've uh, come to the understanding of is we can't take a lot of off-the-shelf parts to do what we're doing. It'd be great if we could, because it would make things a bit easier some days, but it really often doesn't have quite the performance or quite the size or quite the shape or the cost benefit at the end of the day to actually deliver that end product that we require. And that's really driven through, and I think something Steve keeps beating me up about on a fairly daily basis is this has to be cost-effective for the grower as well. It has to be accessible to the end user. So how are we developing that technology to do that? So we go from everything from developing our own robotics, our own machine vision systems, and bringing that software and control and analytics through into an entire package so we can offer that to what's required to actually get those in commercial runs, which is also pretty exciting for a team of the dynamic value you bring through and the offset of how that actually plays against each other is quite cool. But looking at the world in 2020, we're projecting to have 34 billion connected devices and a trillion sensors. How can we go about utilising this and utilising those aspects to actually help develop the technology and insights and learnings further? So I'm going to cover off a couple of our, our main projects at the moment. I'd love to tell you a bit more about the confidential one, but um, confidentiality is, is fun at times, but that's coming out soon. Um, but our robotic apple packer, uh, we're building 20 of those units at the moment and about to ship some to the US, which is quite a cool step, and then the multi-purpose orchard robotics, which is also done in collaboration with uh, University of Auckland, University of Waikato, and it's a um, plant and food research as well, and it's a collaborative MBIE-funded project. So there are four of our apple packers in a pack house from a 
camera feed we had in there, um, showing the operation and the people around supporting that work um, for those machines. So you walk into these pack houses and these, these big areas, all this machinery through there, operating, working away, and you get this concentration of, of people um, packing the apples into those trays. This is a pack house in the US, a fairly typical application. And they're really constrained by that. It's stopping their growth in this industry. So what we've developed is this packing technology. Where our machine's quite cool is it actually orients all the apples as it's coming through. It then picks them up, rotates them, and places them into these trays. So the, you can see all the stems there are horizontal. Uh, we can do some color packing at times too. And, but it's getting those presentation packs and that packing quality for that export market. And we're pretty excited where that technology is now and those partnerships Steve mentioned with the likes of Jenkins and Van Doren to take this technology to the world. Then the orchard robotics side. You Hopefully, you've wandered past the platform out there. Everyone keeps telling me it's a lot bigger in real life than what they thought. So, um, go have a check that out and kick the tires and have a bit of a look. But that's really our machine to be able to deploy these technologies on. So, it carries our systems around. Think of it like a cool new tractor type scenario where you have an implement that goes on it. So at the moment, you'll see it with the harvesting arms. We're also working through pollination, doing some crop estimation. But we see the adaptation of that platform. There's been a heap of interest in how we can use that across a whole heap of different industries. And George wouldn't have seen this one yet either. So that's so this is some of the autonomous navigation. You can see the live feed up in the top corner there. This is the robot actually driving through an orchard, working out what it's doing from all its sensor data. We can't use GPS by itself in this environment because we've got this nice solid roof over us, which is a bit of a pain at times. But um, we've got some pretty cool technology of it working out its environment around it. And that was all the sensing systems coming through. So then when we deploy this with some pollination gear on it, we can drive that or have the robot drive into its environment, work out what's going on. Hey, I'm under a canopy. Let's have a look for some flowers, deploy the pollination systems, and then start tracking uh, where those flowers are. So this system is actually indiv uh, identifying individual flowers, tracking them as we're moving along, and then spraying them with individual nozzles depending on where that flower is relative to the robot. And we're getting some pretty cool results out of this now too, so we're pretty excited where that's going. So we've started off with two booms on it. You can see those little sort of 500 mil wide booms that are trailing up and down and following the canopy as it goes along. Um, the final system we're looking at is actually having, say, six or eight of those, and it will dynamically change to width and track height and everything as it goes along. Out of season, we take those off and put some harvesting arms on. And the team's been pretty good at getting me some footage together from their testing last week of actually showing this machine of, as it stands out there, actually going through and harvesting fruit out of the canopy. Uh, and, you know, they've, we've made some pretty cool progress in the last, since last season of how that's actually operating it and really showing the feasibility and practicality of being able to harvest these, you know, different fruit uh, in a robotic system. We've been trying a whole lot of different grippers and systems around how that needs to work as well because, you know, those tight clusters of fruit uh, is quite important for how we actually get that end result of making sure this is a commercially viable product and we're not just creating some cool tech for the sake of cool tech, which is fun at times. Um, but what we've been really doing over that sort of time of building that team, building that capability within it, and then building these modules and suites of technology that we can then deploy out to other systems. So we've chosen a couple of applications to start that with, but we're already adapting that technology out to other areas. Um, and so that other project that I said was confidential on there, um, what's been quite cool is we've taken some of these modules and in sort of eight months, well, it's been about a year now, but after eight months, the team had deployed this massive 25 meter gantry robot with all these scanning systems on it, and it's deployed and now commercially operating and about to be handed over to a client. But it's because we've had those modules in place and that ability and built that team up, we've been able to do that. We've been able to capture an opportunity of getting some great commercial outcomes, and I really look forward to being able to actually display that technology at some point some point soon to show where it's going, but it's, it's been a pretty cool journey to get to this point. So cheers. Uh, 
look, thank you for the three of you, because you've given such a, a splendidly logical uh, view of um, the, the needs out there in the world, and from, from George's perspective, what the opportunities are. And then um, you, Steve, um, quite fascinating coming at this as a, as a kiwi fruit owner and deeply involved in the whole value chain and seeing these issues across the value chain. And then the way Alistair has um, come along and developed the robotics part of that. So that's, uh, th there's a huge integration there, which is very impressive. Um, a couple of questions. In, um, in terms of um, how soon it will be before um, a robotic um, platform like that is actually in commercial production and being sold in some volume, they'll, they'll be custom made. What sort of time frame are you looking at that for um, to actually get this into hands of orchardists or at least agricultural contractors who will then be taking them out? I'll, I'll give you my time frame. I keep telling Alistair we need this next week. Um, but I'll let Alistair explain how long that might take. But just in terms of the apple packers, they are commercial now. We are, we are um, exporting to the US and selling. Um, in terms of the other technologies, they are in our pipeline of ongoing development, but Alistair can um, share some of the insights around the platform. Yeah, so the platform technology, were, it's, it's interesting where we're developing a, a new system and then putting complex devices on top of it, whether it's harvesting or, or pollination. So what we're actually looking at doing is over the next year, we've got another cool partnership going where we're actually looking at deploying that platform technology by itself to do another application that's not as complex. Um, and that will get us some runs on the board in another area to get that vehicle out and going. We've had so much interest across so many sectors for platform technology like that that can drive around and happen to put something on it. So we okay. see that over the next couple of years will be um, strong commercial runs, which will be neat. It's then the systems that come on top of it again. So, you know, big challenge with us in the horticultural industry is the seasonality. You know, we get a couple of months to test the harvesting arms and then yeah, yeah. all the fruit's gone and lab testing just does not replicate the real world of what, of what you experience. It can help at times, but it doesn't really get you those end game uh, gains that you need. So I'd see those are a few years off um, because of that seasonality of being, we were at a point where we can strongly commercially ramp it up. But you know, if you, that video coming through is getting pretty exciting on where we're at with that tech and how we can then deploy it. Um, and we've also deployed that into some other crops now too with some prototypes coming out, but... Um, yeah. So I, I think it's important to understand too that we've been really one of the keys for us is actually building the talent behind this. So it hasn't been let's rush out, let's get this out tomorrow. It's been a really constructive way of, of small successes and building and building the talent. This is about um, building a world-class capability that then will be able to solve those problems um, you know, um, in, a, in a lot easier way. And the example Alistair gave before was when we're able to have a, a customer come forward and say, we'll front load the funding to get this solve our solution, and we had parts of all those modules already within the system, it was very quick to deploy and create that technology for them. Well, th this then leads to a question, really, of George. Um, I'm always fascinated by the um, interaction between uh, a small and innovative New Zealand company, and you, you know Robotics Plus well from that point of view. Um, but uh, Yamaha, though you are a very small division in a very large uh, global company, um, you would have a, a speed and scale um, in terms of the trajectory of where you're going, which is very different from, from Robotics Plus. So h how do you match... Um, the progress they're making, and you're making good progress, but y you need um, big, it, due course, you're going to need big volume. How, how do you um, make that work? Well, there's two parts to that. One is, uh, within Yamaha Motor, we operate fairly independently so that we can move quickly, make decisions, collaborate. Um, if we need help from the existing business, that's a little different issue because we then have to they have their own priorities and their projects, and we have to work within in their constraints. But our goal is to find out how can we help them be successful. Um, money is, to be frank, the easiest part of the equation. Yeah. Um, money is fungible. It, you can, if you can find someone that believes in your vision, they'll give you money. Um, I think the harder part is, is finding the resources within Yamaha, whether it's the engineering resources, the manufacturing resources, the ways that we can provide value to help them scale up 
uh, and, and do it at a, at a global basis. Um, that's where the real opportunity is, even for us. Uh, it's not just the investment. We're, we're not investing with the hope that there's going to be an IPO and a big financial exit. It, we're really trying to solve a problem together. And how do we do that in a way that, that allows them to be successful and sustainable on their own. Uh, given that uh, Yamaha is already big in robotics, um, is there already some good synergy or uh, is Robotics Plus got sort of quite a different view of, of, the, sort of the, 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 the philosophy of robotics, if you like, versus what Yamaha is doing? Well, I'll let them answer that question because <laughs> they'll be able to sp speak more to what, um, uh, you know, they think of, of us. but. Um, I, I can't go into details, but we are uh, exploring opportunities to collaborate and support them beyond just the financial investment. Um, but we've had, in the last 12 months, nine of those, you know, six of those nine visits that I've made to New Zealand, I brought board members, engineers, business folks. We've had, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 different executives. I mean, these were like board member at the, at, the, at the parent company level, take the time to come down here, meet with them, hear them, look at their technology, go on and into the field. Um, and that really comes from the desire to, to find a solution and, and build a global platform. So, so if I add, add to that, Rod, so, you know, the beautiful thing I liked about um, having an investment and a, and a partnership with um, Yamaha is that when you think about creating the disruptive technologies, if we um, go and talk to a muff rotor or a compact or those types of people already doing traditional fruit grading systems, they're quite embedded in their footprint and their technology. But if we were really to say that actually we could be packing fruit very differently to the way we're dropping fruit off cups and that's the way we've done it for the last 30 or 40 years, we can sort of take our ingrained knowledge and then go and talk to someone like Yamaha who's never packed a fruit in their life and say, engineers, this is the volume of fruit we want to move, this is how we want to move it, this is what we want to do with it. Suddenly you've got this whole new way of thinking, this whole new fresh approach to how we might do this differently. So for me, it was a, a real key part of this partnership was about being, um, being connected with, with other thought thinkers in a different space within similar industries um, and also from us, if we um, were scaling up our platform, for example, um, we're creating the technology. If we got the experience to how would we roll out building um, 5,000 platforms tomorrow and take them to market, again, we've got this great partnership and great relationship with a world-class manufacturer who can bring that capability and know-how and support to us to actually achieve those goals. Mm. Oh, sorry, Alistair. Yeah, I... I from what you're asking around, I, I think we do have quite a different approach to our technology as well. So um, Yamaha makes some phenomenal robotics gear and it's, it's pretty cool going around their factory and having a look at that side of it. Ours is, we've agged robotics um, and you know, bringing a lot more systems like belt drives and other things like that that aren't traditionally used in a lot of these high-end industrial environments. We're different, we're dirty, it, it, it's wet out there. It's, it's got all these other aspects that come into it. So I think it's quite a different flavour to how you approach the technology, and I think that was also maybe where some of the excitement from yeah. Yamaha came out. It's a different approach, way of looking at it. But where I get excited with the Yamaha side is we don't have a heap of experience and then the design for manufacture and the how do you scale these things to be, to be Yamaha big, but hey, they've got that skill set within that team that can add a heap of value to what we're doing and allow us to achieve that goal of really getting globally dominant, which is pretty exciting. If I may, I'd like to just quickly follow up on something Steve said. One of the assumptions we make in, in everything that we're doing here is that we should not be designing just for today. If you go to any farm, there's an area in the back where they've got rusty equipment and pieces of implements and equipment. We don't want to be in that rust pile. So we want to make sure that we're designing for the future. And that means we have to work with growers who are willing to, as Steve said in his presentation, change the way they grow and, and, and think about automation. Why make an automation solution for an inefficient system? You have to improve the system and then make automation and then together you can make a more efficient, productive system. And so it's that collaboration where we can learn from them and vice versa.